Hi everyone, my name is Theodor Mitev and in this lecture titled The Messages of Media we will discuss Marshall McLuhan's concept of media as encapsulated in his famous formulation The medium is the message. We will start this uh, lecture with a brief examination of uh, the question of what is media uh, itself. Um, and uh, after this, we'll discuss McLuhan's definition while engaging with a number of examples. All right, so what is media? So when you're considering the answer to this question, um, consider the location in which you're uh, perusing this lecture. Maybe you are sitting in front of a computer screen and uh, um, looking at it. Ask yourself, what is media in this context? Is it the screen or is it uh, the platform on which uh, you are watching this lecture? In this case, this uh, should be YouTube. Or is it the lecture itself? Or is it uh, the assemblage of components which creates the lecture, that is uh, the slides and my voice? Um, or is it all of the above? So what is media? This is a really important question because once you start unpacking it, and my goal here is not to give you a precise definition, but to problematize the concept of media in itself. Uh, once you start unpacking this question, you uh, start gaining a much deeper understanding of uh, the process of communication, uh, the process of mediation, and the uh, uh, profound affordances which uh, a change in media generates. And this in turn will prepare us for examining McLuhan's concept of media. All right, so let's start attacking this question. What is media? Let's start looking for answers. Um, the etymological definition of uh, media comes from the Latin medium, uh, which stands for something in the middle. Um, a human or an object can be media in the Latin understanding, insofar as they are in the middle between two other humans or objects. And... Uh, uh, in, in one way or another related to them. In one way or another, they act as mediators between these two other humans or objects. So we have that definition, something in the middle, something which acts as a mediator, which by the way is a word we uh, also have derived from this Latin uh, understanding. Okay, so this gives us a very perfunctory, very superficial understanding of what a medium is something in the middle. Now let's look at some models of communication which involve a definition of media. And the first model of communication that we're engaging with in this context is Harold Laswell's model, which was uh, developed by him in 1948 in his book, The Structure and Function of Communication in Society. And this is his famous formulation, uh, who says what, to whom, in what channel, with what effect. Obviously, this is a definition of the process of communication. It's not of media in itself. However, uh, what is interesting here uh, for our purposes is that uh, Lasso has broken down the process of communication therefore isolating a uh, potential definition of where media is. So let's start attacking his definition uh, step by step. So who is the who in this context? So this is obviously the originator of a message, the originator of uh, a process of information transmission. Uh, this is where the notion of says comes from, right? So this is the person who, or the, the origin of a uh, message. What, in this context, refers to the message itself, right? The message which is to be transmitted, the piece of information that we're carrying across. Whom, in this context, stands for, obviously, the addressee of that message. So it's the destination of the piece of information we're carrying across. Finally, we have what channel. In this context, the channel stands for that something in the middle across which we're carrying the piece of information, across which that message is transmitted from the originator to the end point. So this would be uh, our direct uh, fit for that Latin notion of something in the middle that what channel element of Harold Laswell's model. And finally, we have with what effect. 
which is interesting because Lasso here suggests that there is an effect from the transmission of a message. There is, in his model, there is always an effect. There is always a change which is af affected by the transmission of a message, by that transfer of a piece of information from point A to point B, and that effect is more, moreover, measurable, right? It defines that process of communi it, communication. It tells us that something has been transmitted, that something has been mediated over a channel. Okay, so far so good. We have some sort of working understanding of a process. We have a working understanding of the fact that there is a transmission of information. And uh, we have a working understanding of the fact that there is a medium, something in the middle, something in between an origin and a destination, a point A and point B, over which information is transmitted. And also, presumably, and this is not captured by the last one model, there is an effect which we can observe uh, from a vantage point, right? Presumably, this is an effect that can be observed by the originator of the message from their vantage point uh, over the channel, over the medium uh, through which the information is being transmitted. Okay, so far so good. So this gives us something to work with. Uh, this gives us something to uh, attack the question of what is media. Now, let's look at another model. Uh, this model is uh, known as the Shannon and Weaver model, and it was developed by a famous mathematician called Shannon and Warren Weaver in their book, The Mathematical Theory of Communication, uh, also coincidentally published in 1948, uh, immediately after the Second World War. Uh, as you can see, this model is far more detailed in its attempts to capture the same process. This is the process of communication. So, Let's try and map it to what we learned so far. So we have a source, right? So this is our whom, right? So looking back at uh, the last one model, we have the who says what, to whom, in what channel, with what effect. So we have the who, which is the source. But then we have something interesting. We have an encoder. Then we have a message. And then we have a decoder. And then we have the receiver. So uh, looking at all of this, it's clear that uh, the source and the receiver map nicely to the who and to the whom. But what happens to the what, which is presumably here the message, and the channel uh, in the in the uh, last one model? So what happened to, to the uh, message and the channel here? And then you uh, when, when you compare the two models, when you try and map them, you realize that Channel and Weaver's model uh, has a very interesting presumption here. Because it uh, presupposes that uh, the channel, in this case the encoder and decoder, have, has an active role in formatting the message. Right? Because notice how there is a source, there is an encoder, there is something which encodes the message uh, originating from that source, the piece of information that uh, which that source wants to transmit to the receiver. So there is something which encodes that message, right, in a specific format, thereby formatting it, thereby limiting it in a certain way, thereby transforming it in a certain way, thereby giving it certain affordances, right? So we have an encoder, we have the message which the encoder has formatted, including noise, and I'm not going to go into noise because it's a... a uh, really interesting concept in cybernetics, which, by the way, Claude Shannon was one of the uh, originators uh, uh, of, in terms of uh, um, the, the, the whole theory of cybernetics, together with Norbert Wiener. And focusing only on the encoder, the message, and the decoder, what else can we say? We can see uh, clearly that a channel, the notion of the channel, the notion of the something in the middle, the notion of the medium, involves a message, but also involves a process of formatting that message, the process of changing it as it is being carried across, as it is being transferred from point A to point B, from source to receiver. The medium changes that piece of information. That This is what the Shannon Weaver model basically declares. right? So there is an encoding element, there is a decoding element, and there is a message which is being encoded and decoded. right? And moreover, and this is a really interesting aspect of the Shannon Weaver model, we have a feedback loop in place, right? So we have a direct feedback from receiver to source, 
which the source uh, of the message can observe um, and uh, change their, their presumed further messages based on that feedback, right? So this directly speaks to us in terms of the what effect in the, in the last one model. So we have a source, uh, a message, which the source wants to transmit to a receiver, a medium which acts as an encoder of that message, uh, formatting it and changing it, transmitting it across, decoding it for the receiver, right? Uh, and then finally, we have feedback over that or the different medium for that matter, which uh, leads back to the source. Uh, the source, the, the originator of the message from their vantage point can observe how their message has traveled. And only once this feedback loop has closed, we can say that there has been communication, right? There has been an effect, there has been change. So this gives us more detail. This gives us a, a different perspective on the same question, but it doesn't answer uh, directly our original question. What is media, right? It gives us more details though. It gives us more material to attack this question because now we know that uh, media in, uh, involves transmitting messages, it, it involves uh, information, therefore it involves perception. We can also de deduce from here that it involves a formatting, it involves encoding and decoding of information, and it involves a change. Uh, which can be measured, right? Which involves feedback, can be measured. There is an effect here. So this gives us something to work with. So what can we say so far, just looking at everything uh, that we've observed? First, we have some sort of origin, right? We have uh, what I have formulated here in the broadest possible uh, and, and the most ambiguous possible sense as uh, reality. So we have uh, some sort of reality, some sort of information surface some sort of information interface, if you will, uh, or, or call it an origin or, or a person, etc., which transmits information over media to an audience. Right? This audience might be other users, uh, it might be, uh, um, you know, whatever. The point here is that um, if you if you frame this. Uh, uh, very simplified uh, equation uh, in terms of how you're producing the lecture that you're watching right now. Uh, you see something acting as an origin, and we will return. I, I want to leave this undefined. It's really important for our purposes. You have a medium, in which case you could decide that the medium is uh, the internet, the medium could be uh, your screen, the medium could be YouTube, the medium could be the lecture itself, or it could be all of the above. And then finally, we have the audience, which is, in this case, you watching this lecture. All right, so far, so good. This is very superficial, very ambiguous. Um, and it kind of describes uh, in very broad terms, uh, in, in broad strokes, uh, the, both the models of uh, Laswell and uh, Shannon and Weaver. However, let's imagine that we... Uh, look at this model from the perspective of the user. In, let's immerse yourself in uh, your point of view, you, the person watching this lecture. Let's immerse yourself fully behind your eyes. So what do we see? Uh, let's try and retrace it back to front. Um, so instead of moving uh, originator, medium, uh, destination, or reality media audiences, let's move uh, back to front. So, uh, from your perspective, what can we retrace? Can we reach back to some uh, reality? Is there something which uh, you can point at which is beyond a medium? And when you start tracing it that way, you realize that there is not. Right? You realize that what you actually can reach at uh, moving back to front is you as the audience, right? You as the user, you as the destination of a message if you try to, to retrace it. All you can trace back is other media, literally. All you can trace back is uh, other uh, in, uh, interfaces or surfaces or whatever you want to call it, which act as media. There is no reality at the end point of that uh, interaction.
So all you all you reach back to is other media. And if you think in terms of the feedback, and if you think in, uh, uh, the, the feedback element of uh, the Shannon and Weaver model or the effects uh, of the Laswell well model, what you see here is that uh, we are left with audiences, we are left with users um, who interact with media, are changed by, affected by, formatted by media, and in turn, change, affect, format the media, right? So we have a, a, a feedback loop, a continuous feedback loop of engagement and interaction and formatting uh, between so-called audiences, so-called users in media. Notice how reality is such as a concept or a originator, primary originator of messages has disappeared. All we have is media talking to audiences. But then once you push this further, you realize that all we have left in effect is media because the audiences themselves act as media for other media. So all we have left is media in this context. Again, remember, we are not trying to provide a definitive uh, and final uh, definition of what is media. We're trying to problematize this question. We're trying to dig deeper, as you, uh, if you will, um, into uh, the context here and to, to, to get a deeper understanding of the, 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 the complex uh, problem that media uh, presents. So all we are left with is media. Uh, that being said, now we are ready, in my opinion, to jump into Marshall McLuhan's definition. So uh, the medium is the message, right? The famous Marshall McLuhan uh, dictum, which uh, first appeared in his uh, book, The Understanding, uh, Understanding Media from 1964, um, it's uh, in many respects uh, uh, a fundamental text of, uh, of, of fundamental importance to uh, uh, media theory and to certainly to uh, new media or if you want to call them emergent media, right, which are uh, flagged with the emergence of, uh, of the internet. So if we want to understand uh, this concept, the medium is the message, we need to dig into the way uh, Marshall McLuhan frames it in understanding media. And we need to try and understand what he meant by it. He really rejoiced, he really enjoyed uh, um, framing his formulations in this kind of uh, paradoxical way, uh, thereby forcing the audience to really face the, 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 the profoundly uh, um, complex and problematic and weird, if you will, nature of, of our relationship as humans to media. Okay, so the medium is the message. And here is uh, a direct definition of media uh, from, uh, from uh, Marshall McLuhan himself. The personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. So let's try and analyze this. Let's try and, and break this definition down. What is Marshall McLuhan saying here? First and foremost, we have a immediate direct definition not of communication the process of communication and remember this is what Lasso and Shannon and Weaver gave us we have a direct definition of media itself in itself so what what is that definition so a medium is any extension of ourselves right media act as extensions of us as humans so uh, if we go back to this part of the equation, media audiences, you realize then how this part here, that uh, the distillation of the entire problem into there is all there is is media starts making sense because all we have is extensions of ourselves. All we have is, if you could reformulate it a little bit differently, agency, uh, extensions of uh, human and non-human agency, which just flows around. So we have the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. So media are extensions of ourselves and they have personal and social consequences, which result from the new scale that is introduced into human affairs by the change in media. 
So each new medium introduces a new scale with its own personal and social consequences. Right? Any change in the medium, and remember, I, I, I want to draw your attention back to the Lasso model and to the Shannon and Weaver model. Notice how we talked about encoders, decoders, about effects, about feedback. You can see how this is uh, in, uh, these definitions are involved in McLuhan's definition, but he goes far, far further in his effort to try and, and grasp the real uh, complex relationship uh, uh, humans have with, with media and the, with the process of mediation itself. Because what he's saying, in effect, is that each medium, each new medium, comes with its own set of personal and social consequences, comes with its own scale of reality, as it were. Right? And a change between media entails an immediate change of these scales. Let's try and unpack this further. So, first, as we already pointed out, for McLuhan, a medium is any extension of ourselves. Right? How can we unpack this further? What kind of examples can we give? So, ask yourself this. Are your clothes, the clothes you're wearing right now, are they a medium? Ask yourself, are your shoes a medium? Is your hair a medium? Is your body a medium? Is the language you used to speak and to think with a medium? Is the room you are in a medium? Right? Is the place you live in a medium? Is the platform you use for transport, whether there is a car or bicycle or a scooter or a bus or whatever, train, uh, is it a medium? Right. Once you start asking uh, and, and examining your surrounding reality and yourself for that matter, uh, through this perspective, you start to understand the, the enormity of, uh, of what McLuhan points at here. You start to understand uh, what is it that he's uh, really suggesting by a medium is any extension of ourselves. Now, we've defined the medium, and again, I recall, uh, I, I ask you to recall uh, Laswell's model, and then ask you to recall Shannon Weaver's model, when we have an encoder, a message, and a decoder. Now, contrast this with what McLuhan is saying. A message is the change of scale, pace, or pattern of behavior. So the message is not what is carried literally by that channel or that platform uh, and, and by channel and platform you can think in terms of uh, the screen or, or YouTube as a platform or uh, the, the lecture as a platform etc etc right so it's not that or on my voice and the language I use as a platform it's not he's not pointing at that right he's pointing at the scale pace or pattern of behavior in terms of change right the change of scale this is what the message is and this should ring familiar if you recall in the Lasso model uh, where, where Lasso talks about effect. Should be familiar in terms of the uh, Shannon and Weaver model where they talk about feedback, right? So McLuhan distills this in terms of the change of scale, change of pace, change of pattern. So the message of any medium is the change it affects. How it's, it changes your the way you are. Your, literally how it uh, affects and changes your being from moment to moment, how it formats you into being in a different way, right? From moment to moment. That change of scale, this is what the message is, right? In the McLuhan formulation. And this is interesting now because McLuhan goes further. Remember, we are analyzing, we're trying to problematize the entire problem of what is media and we the, <laughs> problematize the problem, uh, as it were. We're trying to uh, uh, use McLuhan's dictum, the medium is the message, for that purpose. And notice what McLuhan is saying, in effect. If you change the medium, right, there is always a change uh, in scale involved. So if the message is the change of scale, pace, or pattern of behavior, a change in the medium is always a change in the message automatically, even if the message is carried across the same, uh, if, uh, the, the, the message that is being carried across is 
ostensibly the same. So think in these terms. Imagine that you are um, sitting at this lecture in a classroom uh, face to face, as opposed to uh, watching this lecture on YouTube or um, um, at home or watching this lecture on YouTube in a train through and uh, listening through headphones. These are three different changes of scale. Thinking uh, in terms of how uh, the medium is changed here, right? So a change in the medium uh, is always a change in scale. And so if you if you were to formulate this as an equation, then on the left side you would have a changing medium, and on the right side you would have a changing scale. And then because it's an equation, there is an equivalence built in. So this stands for the fact that if you if you were to observe a change in scale in something, this signals to you or should be signaling to you that immediately that there is a change in medium. Somewhere there has been introduced a new medium which automatically and immediately creates a new scale. What is more, when you think about this further, you realize that um, McClure's definition actually entails uh, a strange realization. Uh, the content of any medium, right, uh, is always another medium. So, what does, let's unpack this. What does this mean? Think in these terms. Look at, uh, again, look at your screen. Is it a medium? Undoubtedly, it is. But what is the content that this medium is carrying, supposedly? What is the message that is, is it is putting across? Obviously, this lecture. But then, where is this lecture coming from? You are you're producing it from YouTube. So that's it, it is another medium. And then if you look at the lecture on YouTube itself, YouTube being the medium carrying that message, right? The lecture. What is the lecture itself, right? It's an assemblage of different media. So you have a presentation, set of presentation slides. Uh, you have a voice. You have a content that uh, that voice and those slides are carrying. So you have a, a combination of media carrying content. And then what is that content in itself? It is another medium, right? It is a set of symbols, set of signs, which carry meaning, right? And what is that meaning? It is another medium. And then you realize that this is basically an infinite chain. Again, bringing me back to that original definition that we distilled from Shannon and Weaver's model and Lasso's model, right? You remember, we started with reality media audiences. Then we distilled that to media and audiences. And finally, all we were left with is media, right? So the content of any medium is always another medium. All you have is media within media. Here is another reading of this, uh, this concept. Uh, this one is from uh, uh, media theorist Mark Federman. The medium is the message tells us that noticing change in our societal or cultural ground conditions indicates the presence of a new message, that is, the effects of a new medium, which pretty much restates what we already established further, uh, uh, previously. We already established that uh, the fact that there is some sort of change, uh, change of scale, change of pace, change of pattern of behavior, to use McClellan's formulation, uh, indicates that there is a new message, therefore a new medium, right? Because the message in itself is change. The message, the way uh, McClellan understands it, is some sort of effect on reality. And that effect of me on reality is measurable and perceivable because it involves change in reality. Therefore, the medium is the message. Okay, so let's try and unpack this uh, in terms of examples because uh, I do realize that um, this concept can get quite uh, dense, quite abstract. So here we have an example. And I've left, uh, I've chosen this example on purpose because it's... Uh, um, yeah, an, an excellent illustration of this concept of um, media within media within media, right? The uh, message of a medium is another medium. So what do we have here? What is the message of this medium? And uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, analyze this image in, and the follow-up uh, examples in detail. I'm not going to do that uh, in as great detail as possible here. Uh, so that uh, hopefully I can leave uh, uh, further options for exploration for you. But uh, I'll do a perfunctory analysis, let's call it that way. 
Um, so let's start with the fact that uh, we have a Reoka here, what looks like a Reoka. So look at how everyone is seated. Right? What is the message of this medium? Look at the windows. What is the message of this medium? What is the change of scale and pace and patterns of behavior? For now, abstract from the newspapers, ignore the newspapers. Let's look at the carriage itself. Think uh, if, if this is too dense, think in terms of um, contrasting the experiences of uh, any of these humans uh, sitting in this um, uh, railway carriage with uh, the experience of a human who is maybe cycling the same distance or walking the same distance. How would they experience space-time, the same presumably space-time uh, that these people are experiencing through their windows? Right? So how would they experience the landscape? How would you experience the, the, that same landscape if you were to walk that distance as opposed to sit in a quiet railway carriage uh, reading a newspaper and from time to time casting a glance through the window at the landscape. Right? Notice the change of scale, pace and pattern of behavior uh, affected by the change of medium. For the walker, that landscape is immediately present. It involves having to negotiate with the agency of all sorts of different objects. Right? You have the pathway, you have, uh, I don't know, stones, trees, uh, rivers, animals maybe, um, or if this, uh, if, if this landscape is an urban landscape, uh, it involves cars and, and uh, other pedestrians and uh, uh, um, traffic lights, etc., etc. The rich experience of the lived uh, city street, as opposed to the quiet, boring, uneventful uh, train ride with the landscape just passing by as a film on the other side of the window. Right? Notice the change of scale here. So these are the profound effects of a change in media. Now let's look at the newspapers. What, what, is, uh, uh, what is the message uh, of this medium? What is required here? What, is, uh, what are the affordances? Ask, ask uh, these questions, uh, these questions uh, of yourself. Um, try and dig deeper in terms of your analysis. I'm not going to, uh, to go any further for uh, the purposes of uh, time, but you should be uh, thinking in terms of how the, the newspaper is, uh, in this context, in this image, uh, the newspaper is a medium, how does it uh, affect and format the behavior of uh, its users, right? The newspaper is an extension of ourself. All right, let's look at another example. What is the message of this medium? Look at what these people are engaging in. So we have here an uh, early 20th century um, uh, example of uh, some sort of uh, music shop, presumably, or a music uh, listening space, right? With uh, everyone individuated in the separate uh, cabins listening to vinyls, listening to music, uh, presumably. So what can you say about this medium? What is its message? Are these people listening together? Right? And if not, why are they listening separately? What is the affordances that is given to, to uh, the, the users of this medium? What is the change of scale, change of pace, change of patterns of, of behavior? What is the message of this medium? Here is another example. So this is a radio ad. So these are uh, the first consumer-grade radios uh, you know, appearing immediately after the First World War. So this is from September 1924, the Saturday Evening Post. And look at the tagline for the ad. Daddy, let's get Los Angeles. All right, son, that's easy. We'll turn the dials to 55 and get it sure if it is on the air. What is the message of this medium, right? What has certain, suddenly uh, become possible, right? We have, presumably, these people are not in Los Angeles, and yet they can listen to Los Angeles or what uh, is being mediated over the radio as 
Los Angeles, right? Obviously, it uh, stands here for uh, some sort of LA radio station. What else, right? So if, if you if you were to expand this uh, the image from this ad further, you would probably uh, um, uh, visualize this radio being positioned somewhere in the home. Where at home, right? Probably the lounge room, right? The living room. So what has happened suddenly, right? You have the appearance of the living room and everyone uh, sitting around a medium, in this case a radio, listening together to something. Contrast this to this image, right? If you were to extend this this uh, uh, situation to the present, to uh, 2020, uh, the, the year in which I'm recording these lectures, you would probably imagine these people uh, carrying, uh, wearing uh, headphones and listening to these individual, uh, to their own individual music tracks or whatever. Not so here. Here you have a common, a, a common shared experience of listening, right? It's a different medium. What about here? Here we have uh, a crowd uh, in 1920, 20, uh, 1922 New York listening to a baseball game. So what is the message of this medium? Right? How, how are these people in this image, this crowd, different from these people, right? Technically, these people here are also together, but can they communicate with each other, right? Imagine them uh, wearing headphones. Can they communicate with each other? Not really. Not so these people, right? Suddenly, here something very interesting is happening here. Uh, and observing this, uh, this kind of images, uh, I, approaching them as provocations, you can start, uh, or you should be in fact trying to uh, deploy McLuhan's dictum of the medium is the message and try and understand the message of this medium, the change of pace uh, of uh, patterns of behavior. Right? So what has become possible here? Notice how everyone is sitting together, standing uh, around a speaker, listening together, presumably to a live baseball game, which of course, happens somewhere else. So suddenly you have participation from a distance at the same time, a shared participation. And again, most importantly, together. Contrast this with the group of people sitting in a train carriage uh, um, reading newspapers, right? Are they, are they together? Technically, yes, but in practice, no. Each of them is immersed in their own media, right? In fact, even if they wanted to be together, they couldn't insofar as uh, persisting within this media, right? Because you could not uh, uh, literally, even if you wanted to, uh, persist in uh, um, reading a newspaper while at the same time being with everyone else, right? You couldn't communicate that way. You would have to put the newspaper down. Not so here, right? These people are together in all senses of the word while also perusing simultaneously the same message. So you have the appearance of the masses. And this is a really important phenomenon here. And you can see the, the dramatic shift, the dramatic change that the radio introduces as a new medium when it appears for the first time. You have the appearance of the masses together at the same place, right? The shared experience, the communal experience reappears. And I say reappears because uh, arguably in pre-modern societies, for example, societies like medieval Europe uh, uh, were um, pretty much entirely communal, right? Ex all experiences were shared. Uh, however, those were very small communities at best at the size of a, of a city and the neighborhoods of a city, never nationwide communities, right? But the radio allows the appearance of these communities because uh, you could have uh, technically tens uh, or hundreds of millions of people listening to the same message from their living rooms or from open public spaces. Now let's develop this, this thought further. Let's develop this analysis further. Let's see where would it lead us. Let's dig deeper. Let's look at this message, uh, this image and ask what is the message of this medium? Right, so what, what we have here is uh, uh, Adolf Hitler, the first uh, uh, 
of, of the uh, great authoritarian uh, leaders to emerge in in uh, Europe and emerging together uh, pretty much with uh, with uh, Stalin in in uh, communist Russia and here you have Hitler uh, emerging in uh, Nazi Germany emerging in 1933 uh, winning an election and I want you to think in terms of the implications of the radio right as we just established them the emergence of the masses the emergence of uh, the ability to share together in a community one message to participate in one medium so use that realization in the context of the emergence of Hitler and ask yourself would an authoritarian leader uh, of, uh, of this caliber uh, um, uh, be possible without the radio right would would you have the uh, the possibility of uh, a leader like that emerging in a uh, culture without, or in a civilization for that matter, without the radio as a medium. A uh, civilization which presumably relies only on, for example, newspapers. And the answer is a resounding no. Uh, the answer is that uh, this kind of, this level of total uh, author authoritarianism is possible only with the appearance of this kind of totalizing media which allow the emergence of the total masses, right, of uh, everyone or, or a very large percentage in, in a population uh, participating in the same uh, medium, participating in the same in the consumption of the same message. Right? You have the ability of one person, an authoritarian uh, uh, leader, addressing an entire nation at once, right? And an entire nation at once listening to that message, either from their living rooms or from public spaces. So this, you realize here that uh, when it comes to um, understanding of the medium is the message and uh, uh, a new medium introducing new messages, a new medium introducing a change of scale, pace and pattern of behavior, you realize that uh, the, the changes that were wrought by radio were so fundamental that they allowed a completely new types of uh, uh, mass totalitarian politics to appear which would have been completely impossible absent the radio, right? So look at this, this, uh, this is another image which kind of builds the point I'm making. So this is one of the infamous uh, Nazi uh, Nuremberg rallies from 1934. Um, looking at that, think of what is the message of this medium again? Would this kind of uh, mass gatherings be possible even uh, absent the radio? Right. How would these people people hear that message absent the radio? Right? How would they be able to, to, to hear and participate as one, as one community and as acting and reacting in an identical way as one absent the radio? Right? And again, this is to illustrate to you the importance of this uh, uh, this fine-tuned understanding that uh, McLuhan is, is pushing us towards. Right? That uh, if you want to understand a medium, you need to understand the changes which it has uh, uh, brought to life, the, the, um, the change of pace, the change of scale, the change of patterns of behavior, which it has affected, right? It's affordances, it's the new affordances it has brought um, uh, onto, onto uh, human civilization for that matter. Here is, uh, again, to, to finalize uh, uh, this, this point that I'm uh, um, elaborating here, here is another Nazi rally, this one from 1936 in Hamburg, uh, uh, still in Germany. And uh, this is a famous image because uh, uh, what we see, uh, the person we see circled in the image is, is uh, um, a gentleman called uh, August Landmasser, who, as you can probably see, is not saluting. He, he is the only person in the image who is not performing the Nazi salute. Right? And this is a really powerful image, uh, in my opinion, for, for a variety of reasons. Obviously, we have the heroic uh, element and, and August Landmasser, uh, to give you more context, he paid the ultimate price uh, for his uh, non-conformism. Uh, you know, he paid with his life, together with his wife, um, uh, for, for his non-conformism and refusal to conform to the dictator of the Nazi party. 
But what this image portrays here in, in, in terms of our thinking about uh, the medium is the message and uh, analyzing the different uh, media and changes that are wrought by different media, uh, what it portends for us is the fact that there's only one person resisting, right? And the, I, I want to push you to the realization that in an environment um, framed by uh, the appearance of the masses as a result of media such as the radio, non-conformism uh, becomes a, a tremendously costly, prohibitively costly for that matter, uh, to perform. Because everyone else can see that you are not conforming. Right? When everyone can participate en masse in the same event, when everyone can en masse together as a community uh, participate in um, and consume the same medium and act in the same way, wear the same clothes for that matter, and be in the same way as everyone else, there is a tremendous cost. Uh, in fact, it's uh, rising exponentially the more totalizing the medium. Uh, there is a tremendous cost associated with being a non-conformist. Uh, tremendous cost associated with being different, refusing to be like everyone else. Why? Because everyone else can see simultaneously life uh, that you are not conforming. Right? This is a very important uh, um, realization also in terms of uh, how a change in the, in the medium can change dramatically how we perceive ourselves as human beings and how we act as human beings. Why? Because, again, returning to McLuhan's definition, uh, not the media, it's not only that the medium is the message, but a medium is any extension of ourselves. A change in the medium, in effect, a dramatic change, as in, as in the case of the radio, portends a dramatic change in any and all extensions of ourselves. And, in effect, in a change in who we are as human beings. All right, let's push this even further now in terms of other examples. And uh, here is a dramatic change, change of pace and scale and, and pattern of behavior. So we jump from the radio directly to uh, uh, the present. And what we have here is uh, uh, automation, service automation in, uh, in uh, McDonald's in this case. So what is the message of this medium? What is the message um, formatted for us by the appearance of, uh, of uh, automation? the automation of labor, the, the automation of uh, service interactions. What is the medium here? And what is the message of this new medium? I'm not going to answer this, but you should be uh, exploring this further because uh, um, all of us are going to be on the receiving end of the message of automation and the profound changes that it will uh, bring into our lives and in effect the profound changes that it will affect on us as human beings. Here is another example. And again, remember, we are trying to gain a deeper, more complex understanding of media. And uh, we are using McLuhan's The Medium is the Message as a guiding principle in our analysis. So here we have another example. So this is a study that was performed um, in 2014, late 2014, early 2015, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it was performed uh, in uh, um, Myanmar, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand. What's interesting here is that you have a tremendous amount of people, right, millions of people, who are using uh, Facebook, while at the same time are unaware that they are on the internet. Uh, and I, in fact, convinced that they are not on the internet. Right? So people were asked, uh, two very simple questions. So are you on Facebook? Yes or no. And are you on the internet? Yes or no. And the majority of people declare that they're on Facebook and the minority of people declare that they're on, it, on the internet, unaware that the fa that Facebook is a platform operates obviously on the internet. So uh, there is a, there is a um, temptation here to uh, look at that as a case of ignorance, right? There is a temptation to say, oh, these people are just ignorant of what uh, the internet is. Even though that may be the case, this is a quite superficial understanding and uh, we're interested in a much deeper, much more complex um, 
a profound understanding of, of uh, uh, the, 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 the new message and the new media that, uh, that are appearing. So uh, ask yourself this, what does it mean? What does it stand for? What does it portend when people using Facebook as their daily um, um, media diet, if you will, online are unaware that they are somewhere else uh, apart from Facebook, that they are actually online, first and foremost, that they are actually on the internet, first and foremost. What does it mean? What does this tell us about Facebook as a medium? Right? Why Why uh, its users in these countries, uh, the majority of its users in these countries, convinced that they are not on the internet while being on Facebook? And uh, to give you a hint, consider this, consider how most people um, access Facebook through their uh, smartphones, right? through an app. And when you push this further and you realize that uh, people are engaging with Facebook um, on the ter in terms of, uh, of uh, their news diet, uh, so in terms of uh, um, the consumption of uh, um, information packaged as news, their entertainment diet, so again, inf and, uh, information packaged as entertainment, their social messaging, right? so person-to-person -person interactions, so all of this is happening within this one app. And then you realize that uh, uh, in effect, this medium acts as a, as a walled garden, right? So it frames its users in a specific um, set of affordances, which when perpetuated over time, uh, result with, with this sort of uh, perspective that, you know, that's, that's all there is, Facebook is all there is. Right, and if you want to go to the internet, you need to do it in another way because Facebook is is uh, a self enclosed world, right? And this is not uh, uh, pertaining on, only to Facebook. You could extend this to to other social media, but Facebook is kind of a, a, a good example here. So again, change of media, change of messages, change of uh, uh, perception of reality, right? Change of pace and scale and, and patterns of behavior. This example, uh, and this is uh, the final example I'm giving you in this lecture, is uh, really interesting because it uh, builds on, uh, on uh, the, the previous example uh, about uh, Facebook and about the implications of uh, operating within a walled garden. So this was a study um, performed in uh, 2013 and um, the, the the study and feel free to to follow it uh, through uh, through this link uh, on your screen uh, the study is called uh, experimental evidence of massive scale emotional contagion through social networks so uh, what uh, what this uh, uh, the authors of the study did was uh, analyze uh, a massive uh, almost 700,000 uh, people sample on facebook and they concluded that the emotional states can be transferred uh, emotional states can be transferred to other users via emotional contagion, leading people to experience the same emotions without their awareness. We provide experimental evidence that emotional contagion occurs without direct interaction between people. Exposure to a friend expressing an emotion is sufficient and in the complete absence of nonverbal cues. So this is really interesting because here you have a, a direct example again of a change of pace uh, as in this context, uh, the, this is the emergence of Facebook, leading to a completely new type of, uh, of being, um, literally, as a human, right? A situation where even though we are separate uh, and think again about the uh, train carriage with uh, everyone reading a newspaper, but substitute the newspapers for smartphones and everyone being on Facebook. So notice how everyone on that train carriage reading a newspaper could be reading all sorts of different uh, articles and um, uh, there will be zero person-to-person -person communication on that train carriage. Everyone will be immersed in reading uh, their own media. Everyone will be literally, even though physically next to each other, uh, in, 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 in for all intents and purposes, they would be uh, completely atomized and individuated because of their immersion in, in, uh, in, in their own media, in their own information universes as it were. Where is what you have here in terms of Facebook? So again, substitute the newspapers for smartphones, you end up with a situation where people experience emotional contagion. 
uh, people start sharing en mass the same emotions with the fear or anger or anxiety uh, or joy is irrelevant. The point is that suddenly emotions start spreading virally, right? Um, notice what a tremendous jump this is in terms of patterns of behavior, in terms of extensions of ourselves, in terms of who we are as human beings. But this is the tremendous power of media and this is the tremendous uh, power when it comes to change in media and change in uh, the messages of media. Okay, so let's look at yet another example. Um, again, we are trying to understand first what is media and then we're trying to use McLuhan's definition of media as any extension of ourselves in order to examine this question in depth. Right? We uh, have as our guiding light the notion of the medium is the message. So let's look at the case of writing media. Right? Uh, a piece of medium that everyone listening to this lecture will be familiar with. So um, writing media for the context of this uh, uh, example, uh, starts with uh, the papyrus scroll, even though th technically this is not the case, uh, because we have uh, much older examples of writing media than the papyrus scroll, which are, for example, the clay tablets of uh, Mesopotamia. But for our purposes, to keep it very simple, we have, uh, we're starting with the papyrus scroll, which uh, originated in the Mediterranean. No one knows exactly where, most probably in Egypt, uh, but no one is certain. Um, and uh, the papyrus scroll looks something like this. Uh, so you have basically a, a row of paper, which uh, if, if large enough can be separated into two rows. And you are um, to read, you have to unroll one part while rolling in the other. And to read, you need to keep unrolling uh, the, the scroll. So. I want, in, in giving you this example uh, and the following examples uh, of writing media, I want to uh, push you to examine the mechanics of the media that I am showing, and I want to push you toward to a realization of the way the me the very mechanics of the medium frame the way the message is written. Uh, the message here being the text, which is another medium in itself. Again, remember. The message of any medium is another medium. So uh, think of the mechanics of uh, reading a papyrus scroll. What type of reading is involved here? Right? How can you actually read a papyrus scroll? Think in terms of what is involved literally, uh, processually, if you will, in, uh, in, in, in uh, um, the act of reading a papyrus scroll. And when you think this through, right, you realize that uh, the scroll permits of only a certain type of access to the information encoded within it. Let's frame this as sequential access. Why? Because you can access that information sequentially, right? Sequence by sequence, uh, line by line, as it were. There is no other way for you to access it, right? This, it, uh, from the perspective of a scroll writing and scroll reading, reading culture, it doesn't make any sense to ask a reader to jump to page 57, right? There are no pages on a scroll. It's a continuous linear deployment and unfolding of information, which demands as its affordance, right, as a medium, only sequential access both in terms of reading and writing, right? So it allows a certain type of reading and writing in effect, right? You cannot write in a, in a, a way which is in contrast with uh, sequential reading, right? Because people will not literally won't be able to read what you wrote. So we have the papyrus scroll and we have the fact that it permits sequential access. And the question you need to be asking yourself is, what kind of writing would fit this type of reading? And as a corollary of that, what are the affordances of this uh, uh, medium? 
right? What does it allow? What does it prohibit? How does it format the information? And again, I, I, I remind you of Laszlo and Shannon and Weaver's models. And I remind you of the dictum uh, that the medium is the message, right? A change of, uh, and a message uh, portends a change of pace, change of scale, change of pattern of behavior. Right? So what are the, how, how does a papyrus scroll format our reading and writing? And while you're pondering this, let's contrast the papyrus scroll with the codex, which uh, codex is the, the Latin uh, ancient Roman description, and we know it as the book, right? So um, the codex appeared uh, in, in again in the Mediterranean, in, uh, in ancient Rome, and it was a, a revolutionary medium, which emerged in a papyrus writing and reading civilization, right? And it emerged and eventually supplanted papyrus as the primary medium for writing and reading. Why did I say it's revolutionary? So think of the book again. What type of reading and writing does it allow? Can you, uh, is, it, is it limited in the same way? Are its affordances identical to the affordances of the papyrus scroll? And the answer is clearly no, right? There is a fundamental profound change between the two, both in terms of the, literally the mechanics of writing and, again, literally the mechanics of reading involved, right? You can, to, 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 to point at the most obvious, the most superficial, the most trivial observation, you can jump between pages here, right? You can start reading from the end, if you will, right? You can start reading from, from the middle, right? You can jump between boring passages. the book permits you random access to information. It's not sequential anymore. It's not limited to one specific sequence that has to be followed linearly, right? Information is encoded instead in discrete chunks, which can be perused at will randomly, right? So both in terms of reading and in terms of writing, the codex presents a completely new medium, allowing new types of reading, new types of writing, literally new types of being, right? Because again, remember, a medium is an extension of ourselves. Again, different affordances entirely. So let's make another big jump and look at uh, the World Wide Web, look at the internet. What are the affordances of the internet? Is a writing medium. What are its affordances as a reading medium? Again, think in terms of uh, cost, who can read, who can write, what is involved here. Think in terms of how reading can, can proceed online. So uh, to, to make this even simpler for you, think in terms of Wikipedia and your experiences of uh, reading a Wikipedia page, right? And I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with that uh, 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 experience of, you know, starting uh, on Wikipedia by reading one thing, let's, let's say you're reading about the history of papyrus scrolls, and three hours later you find yourself uh, on a page discussing Japanese basket weaving, and you've no idea how you moved from papyrus scrolls to Japanese basket weaving, uh, and, and what happened over these three hours. And this sort of reading, heterogeneous reading, let's call it that way, is made possible only uh, by the fact that the internet allows a completely different type of writing, right? Writing using hypertext, right? Linking different words to completely different pages, right? Which allow you to jump between texts at, in a completely random manner, right? Which give you hyper access to information as opposed to the sequential access of papyrus scrolls and, to, and the random access in the codex, in the book, right? So you have hyper access here, which again, gives you um, a completely new type of, of uh, content formats, completely new type of reading and writing. So in effect, uh, and I'm uh, wrapping up uh, this little um, adventure in, in uh, the realm of uh, definitions of media and McLuhan's understanding of, of media and, and the concept of the media is the message. What we have here is the realization that a change in media, the appearance of new media, um, like in the in the context of uh, uh, writing and reading, 
a change in media leads to immediately to a new change, a new type of uh, writing, uh, a new type of reading, and in effect, a new mode of thinking, a new new mode of being as a human, right? Uh, a change in uh, a medium automatically leads to change in messages, even if the presumably the information you want to send is the same, right? The message is already different because the medium has changed. And the fact that the medium has changed and the message has changed uh, uh, results in a change in scale, change in pace, change in pattern of behavior, change in um, the extensions of ourselves, a change in being. Thank you for listening and see you online.